and title is integrable system. So integrable system, it has a subtitle, twisters, loop groups, and Riemannian ah, surfaces. The pink, pink one. And this is by uh, H. N. Siegel and Ward. Okay, so I see how much we can follow this book. Um, but at least uh, we are uh, starting from this book. Uh, okay, make this a slightly bigger. Um, so today it's a kind of some flavor introduction, uh, starting from it's basically following some of the stuff uh, from that book. Okay, um, some questions. Yes, <laughs> uh, I'm confused. So, uh, so basically, uh, I think uh, we uh, so we don't have any uh, universal definition for the integrable integrability for the PDEs. Yeah. So, but yeah, the question is, what's the relationship between the solitons and integrable system? Uh, I think I try to find some integrable system and it's uh, and uh, the soliton equations. Oh, solitons equation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I think maybe um, we will see a kind of connection as we go. Um, um, you will see some uh, uh, connections uh, to KDV equations and things like that. Uh, so, but yeah, so at this point is a little awake, but maybe, I don't know, the a general correspondence. Now this, this first uh, lecture is going to be a little general, so you might have some uh, some understanding in general sense, but we're not going to talk about particular uh, that particular uh, equation. Um, but like, uh, so let me start. I think uh, part of your question will be related to what I'm going to say. Okay, so not exactly that equation, but uh, uh, so we're going to look at some equation. Um, so yeah, as you said, there, there, there's not a word like everywhere accepted definition of an integrable system. It is a, a huge sub subject, but you can look at it from different perspectives. Um, uh, but let's, uh, there are some general features. And this general features uh, of identifying if a system is integrable or not. Uh, one is, is uh, existence of uh, many conserved quantities. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, we give an example of that, but I think uh, uh, conserved quantities, like if you look from physical point of view, for example, you know, energy is conserved. Now, if you're uh, uh, in a configuration space, uh, or if you're in a phase space, you have, if you have certain energy, you're gonna, the, you, you're gonna keep the same energy level no matter what, because the energy is conserved. So that means you cannot move arbitrarily ar around the phase space. You have to just go through a state with the same energy. Uh, but if you have a higher dimensional space, if you limit yourself to a hyper surface, uh, then still you have a lot of freedom, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you prefer that you only have one degree of freedom and that's the direction that tells you what is the equation of motion. Uh, okay, so like if, if you're thinking of a, a, like a something which has, is like a sphere, okay? And if you look at the height function, um, and let's say this height function is your energy, you know if you're sitting at this point, then you're gonna have some amount of energy and that is going to be conserved as system evolved. So that means you don't have a much degree of freedom. You have to go along the circle with the same energy, right? It tells you how your system can evolve because you have this conserved quantity. Uh, but my example, it's, it's a two-dimensional configuration space. Uh, so of course, if this was uh, three-dimensional, then the, this green would not be a curve, would be a plane, right? 
And that means you still have, you still don't know what is going to happen. You can go anywhere inside that surface. So that means you need more conserved quantities to identify exact trajectory of your system, okay? So um, that is how uh, this is going to, to work. So you, you prefer you have enough conserved quantities so can, they can describe your, uh, the evolution of your system. Uh, so as, as this suggests, the, the next sense uh, in, in which this uh, uh, integrable system being described is that uh, you have uh, explicit solution. So uh, the ability to give explicit solutions, okay? Um, you kind of see how this could be related to this conserved quantity. The last one, which is a little bit vague now, is uh, the kind of uh, algebraic geometry. Um, so I think I uh, present of algebraic geometry. Uh, we get to uh, some discussion uh, like this relation to algebraic geometry. Uh, but this is, we're going, we're going to start with the example and go through this different aspects, okay? Um, uh, that we're going to follow is, uh, is the example of, uh, this is the example, motion of uh, a rigid body um, around center of mass, okay? So you can imagine uh, something like, um, let's say a hat. So say you have a, uh, what is it? This, is, this is somebody's hat, okay? It's a, an arbitrary solid object. And uh, you have some coordinate is the center of mass for this hat of the kids, maybe. Uh, by the way, I think uh, for the interoperability of... Yes, go ahead, I'm hearing. Ah. I mean, for the uh, interoperability yes, of uh, we have uh, explicit definition. It's a uh, real interoperability. So, which means uh, the conserve uh, conserve uh, quantity. So, uh, so if we have an n-dimensional uh, uh, space space, then we have n-dimensional uh, conserved quantity. Yeah, it's just that the number the number of conserved okay. quantities, which you could guess from uh, what I was describing uh, here. But yeah, uh, we're gonna make that more explicit. This is like a, now the general. Uh, a general point of view. So, uh, so as I said, uh, you got, we're gonna think of this rigid body, and uh, if you want to describe uh, a bot like a hat, even let's say in three-dimensional space, uh, you need uh, more than three number. You need three numbers to describe where is the center of hat, the position, right? But you need to also describe uh, how it's rotated. So you need more numbers. So sometimes they use Euler angles um, or uh, elements of like a rotation group uh, to describe a general configuration. Uh, but let's say the center of mass is fixed. The object is not moving. It can only rotate and it will have a dynamical system. Okay. And uh, the same way that you have uh, you have equation of uh, motion uh, from Newtonian mecha mechanics. If you remember, we have F equal MA, right? Yeah. Uh, which describes a Newtonian system, uh, which you can think of it as M F equals MV dot, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if you want to describe uh, a system, which is like a hat, but is rotating around, it's, it only has rotational degree of freedom. So it's, we are not looking at the particle which can go in any direction in a space time, that would, in a space that would be Newtonian mechanics. Instead, we're looking at the, at the physical system 
which you can only, you, you, your state is kind of described by a rotation parameter. It could be a matrix rotation or, or an Euler angle, anything like that, right? Uh, so that would be your space. And then you could ask, uh, what, is, uh, what is the analog of uh, f equal mv dot? Mm -hmm. um, so, so of course, f is some uh, force here. So we, here you, you can see something from a unit, right? Uh, what? Sorry. Uh, from unit. So the f unit is Newton. Then uh, the m is kg. Then you times some m divided s. So you can guess. Uh, basically, I think something related to the momentum. I, I don't have. Yes. Yes. I'm not good in this memorized, but uh, I think I did something related to that. Yeah, yeah, that is true. So this is uh, definitely you can describe this in terms of momentum in a, in a actually in a good sense. Um, uh, but basically, uh, what I want to tell you mathematically is that if you want to think of the system, uh, this v dot v was the tangent vector, right? V was the tangent vector. Now, uh, what is the tangent vector? Uh, to a configuration. So if you think of all this configuration as a group SO3, group of three-dimensional rotation, then a tangent group would come from a Lie algebra of that group, mm -hmm. uh, which has a parameterization. Mm -hmm. There are different ways to parameterize. That would make a difference in calculation, but that's not uh, the topic of uh, today. So I don't go uh, in detail, but uh, you can try to parameterize in many different ways, but this, the basis is the space of anti-symmetric uh, matrices, right? So that's, um, um, okay. So you, yeah, you can look at the Lie algebra of SO3. There, there are ways to uh, write them down, but that element of this will sit uh, as a tangent vector, which will be a velocity vector. And we also have now V dot. Uh, M here, F equals MV dot, M is kind of resistance uh, to, to a particle moving. Like if a particle wants to move more mass, this means more resistance. So this, uh, uh, we will have uh, two objects. Uh, uh, one is omega, which is basically angular velocity, uh, which you can describe it by omega one, omega two, omega three. Uh, you can also describe it by uh, a Lie algebra, element of Lie algebra, okay? So that would be omega, but also there is inertia. Uh, so this is principal moment of inertia. Uh, so this means uh, basically resistance to rotation. The same way that the mass was here, it was resistant to a particle moving in a straight line, I would describe resistant rotation. But let's just write uh, what is the equation of motion. Um, if you write the original equation, it will look like uh, I1 omega 1 dot equals I2 minus I3. And uh, same I2, uh, they're, they're kind of symmetric. Uh, so this one is going to have I1 and I3 I minus I1, omega 3, omega 1. And then I3, omega 3 dot equals um, I1 minus I2, omega 1, omega 2. Okay, so that would be the system of equation. And again, uh, uh, you can think of the left-hand side as being mv dot, right? Because uh, omega is like velocity vector. You have mv dot and you have this, uh, this equation, which is basically, uh, it, this is a particular uh, uh, system of, uh, for a particular system that you can think of for a, for a rotational object. But let's say, let's say we are giving this differential, uh, this equation, which is nonlinear. We have omega one, omega two, omega three, you can think of them as a scalar, but you have omega two times omega three on the right-hand side. And you know this, uh, you could guess this was nonlinear because 
we are living like on space of rotation, which is a nonlinear space, like SO2 is a nonlinear, SO3 is a nonlinear space. But uh, we want to kind of rescale all these quantities uh, so that, uh, so we rescale the quantities to absorb this I, I factors into this uh, variables. This is just to make things uh, more uh, uh, natural mathematically, we get a better looking equation. And what you get is, uh, so the, the new variable, we call it u, is u1 dot is u2, u3. This goes for the first equation. And uh, u2 dot is u1, u3, and u3 dot is u1, u2. Okay, now this is now a, a very uh, natural looking nonlinear um, differential equation, system of differential equation that we want to uh, look at. And uh, as I said, this is an example of integrable system, and we want to see different different ways how this is a, how this makes sense. First of all, let's look at uh, conserved quantities. Okay, uh, this is simple. Uh, basically, if you look at, for example, u1 squared minus u2 squared, this would be a function of time. So a solution would be, for this would be a, a time evolution, u1 of t, u2 of t, u3 of t. Uh, but if, if you do, if you have this quantity and if you do d dt, okay, uh, you apply the rule like this is 2u1 dot u1, right? minus 2u2 u two dot u2. Uh, but if this solves that equation, you can use u1 dot from here. So this would be 2u2 u3 u1 minus 2u1 uh, u3 u2. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, this is just uh, zero, right? Mm -hmm. So this is just zero. And uh, what it means that this quantity is not going to change over time. So uh, uh, u1 squared minus u2 squared is going to be a constant a and is not going to change over time, okay? Uh, you could also do the same thing with uh, u1 minus u3 and you end up with the exact same calculation. And then you say u1 squared minus u three squared, that has to be another constant B. Okay, you could do U1, U2. You again know that's a constant. There, any combination you get is a constant, but this constant, uh, some of them you can express in terms of other, right? So if you have U1, U2, U1, uh, U3, uh, you can say what it would be U1, U2, by just relating A and B. This A and B will identify the rest of constants, right? So this, this is, a, in, a, in a sense, a maximum, or like a minimal uh, set that you could have. So you have this cons conserved quantities. And uh, let's try to uh, visualize uh, what happens with these conserved quantities. Um, first of all, uh, I, I just want to, this is just a side play. Let's, let's just visualize uh, what happens here. So if you have a, a U1, say U1, U2, U3 plane, which is kind of, <laughs> tilted here, uh, uh, but the first equation is a degree two uh, equation. And, and I think you remember what is the, uh, the, how the graph of something like this in X, Y plane look like, right? It, you get a, a parabola and it will look like something like this, right? Uh, but it doesn't depend on U3. That means you need to keep continuing this for the rest of, right? So that would be the equation of first one. But now uh, you also have u1 squared minus u3 squared equals a constant. That will give you another curve. Let's say um, this is in u1, ut, u3 plane. And there, there, there are two of them. I just draw one of them, but that's okay. Um, but you, let's say you get another one and then you have to kind of go in U2 direction. Uh, but the point is, 
these two curve you think, uh, they're going to intersect at some curve, right? There's another curve on the other side, which I don't draw, okay? Uh, but you see how, uh, like I have a kind of uh, a parabola which goes forever in one direction and there is another one rotated and you, you look at the intersection, it gives you a curve, a one dimensional curve, which I represented as red here, right? Uh, so what we observe here is that uh, having this two conserved quantities mean you're gonna have curves. If you tell me A and B, I'm going to identify curves here so that your system has to evolve along that curve. Uh, to preserve that conserved quantity, there's no other way. So you, you have this in a sense. If it only if you only have one conserved quantity, that will be the case. Okay. Um, let's now um, look at some uh, algebraic geometry point of view. Um, so basically, looking looking at polynomials and. Uh, uh, remember, we had u1 dot equals u2, u3. And uh, we look at the con conserved quantities and we had uh, u1, what was the conserved quantity? Uh, was u1 squared minus u2 squared is a. But let's say I want to express everything now. Because I can do this, I can express everything in terms of u1 uh, because uh, u2 is just u1 squared minus a, right? So u2 is u1, uh, u2 squared is u1 squared minus a, right? That clear? So this comes from previous equation. And the last one, tell me u3 can be written in terms of u1. So u3 is u1, u3 squared is a u1 squared minus b. Okay, you put all this together and they just give you u1 dot equals u1 squared minus a u2 Oh, sorry, u1 squared minus b. Everything is now in terms of u1, right? Just one variable. And remember how, why we could do this because we had enough conserved quantities to reduce all variables into just one. Now, uh, now typically, th this is a, a very, um, I think deep point of view, um, which I don't want to go through it in details here, uh, but when you have a manifold, sometimes uh, you look at the tangent bundle, right? And the points of the tangent bundle uh, are of the form, uh, let's say X and, and uh, V such that X is in your manifold and V is in the tangent space at that point, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it, and you also can, you can also look at the cotangent bundle. And um, again, you, sometimes people, you can think of this again as, um, as a momentum space. But uh, what I'm trying to point out uh, when you have a differential equation of first order described in terms of velocity vectors and position vectors, then uh, uh, like if you have, for example, y prime equals, I don't know, y, things like that. Sometimes you can describe y prime in terms of the tangent, a tangent vector t curve. Uh, and uh, so when you look, Okay, if, if you look at Tm as the manifold by itself, this is another manifold, we call it n, uh, then a differential equation in a coordinate in this manifold, so you have a coordinate for your manifold, your original manifold m is n dimensional, so let's say dimension of m is n, then dimension of Tm is going to be 2n, right? Uh, but you can still have a chart on this manifold n so this is n. You can still have a chart and you can still write down equations here. Uh, so for example, here you have two n variables. Let's say you have x1, 
to xn, and you also have y1 to yn. Now, if you write an equation, x1 minus y1, I don't know, squared plus da 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 equals one, okay, if you keep doing this. Uh, um, is x1 then, y1 squared plus x2 minus y2 squared? Yes, yes. Uh, so like, yeah, you can think of any example like that. And then this will describe like a sphere, right? This will describe something like, uh, not a sphere. Um, like if, if you are only looking at, uh, um, this is telling you, okay, I don't wanna say if I, I could change this to a plus or, or something else. I don't wanna get stuck into example. But I, I, what I'm trying to say, this will give you a curve or a surface or a, or a sub-manifold of R2n, say, or, or um, in, like that many variables. Then this is when you're looking at from n coordinate system. But when you go back and look at that from Tm point of view, you have to replace y1 by a velocity vector. So that would be like x1 dot, sort of, okay? so. The same thing, which looks like an equation for a manifold, like a surface, something like that, it has an interpretation of differential equation. And this amounts to you looking at n as a manifold by itself and some coordinate chart, or you look at it as a tangent bundle over m. When you look at it as a tangent bundle over m, this equation is a differential equation. But when you look at it just from n point of view, this is just an equation on, on that manifold that can be described in terms of any local chart, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that was uh, the correspondence, which again shows up, uh, this, is, this is a longer story. It shows up in uh, different areas, uh, but I just wanna uh, do the same thing. And I wanna look at U1 dot, and I wanna identify that with a variable, I call it X. This is like going to the end coordinate when we forgot that u1 dot was a tangent direction, um, right? And then uh, let's call u1, oh, sorry, u1 is x and u1 dot is y, okay? And then that equation, basically, this equation is star, it basically means now it's, it's an algebraic equation, uh, which tell you y equals x star. Right? Okay. Okay. So this is an equation. This is equation of an elliptic curve. And uh, uh, there is actually, you can define a regular differential form uh, on this one. Um, because here you can think of um, uh, dx dy uh, in, in, on this new manifold, let's say defined by xy. Uh, but basically there is a differential form uh, dxy, uh, which uh, is in a sense regular. We will uh, talk about this later more in more details, but this is like a regular differential form. Uh, defined on this manifold, uh, on the curve. Um, from this point, what I, what I want to go is that um, any differential form has a special kind of representation, uh, which is like this. Uh, let me check something before. Um, yeah, which looks like this. So y squared is 4x cubed. Uh, I don't want to now talk how you get from this form to that form, uh, but there are constant g2 and g3, and you can turn any elliptic curve to a representation uh, like this. And when you get to this representation, uh, you can use what is called uh, a Weierstrass p, uh, uh, p function, uh, which is a doubly pr double periodic uh, 
I, I tell you what that means, periodic uh, wire stress down to one extra E. P function. Um, which which is this double period, double double periodic basically means that there are some complex number w one w two such that p of uh, you think of it as a complex number um, for any integer m and n um, this is p of u okay uh, we should make a picture to explain this. And the picture is the following. Um, uh, you say, let's say I, I make a choice of W1 and W2. Uh, you, usually you can rotate a pair so that it's like a, under like a conformal kind of map so that one of them just sits on the unit vector so that you describe with W2, depends on the context. Uh, but uh, if you give me a pair like this, then I can form a lattice. And the lattice, it's, it's just looking at that two point as, and their combinations, okay, you just repeat forever, okay. Uh, so this is not, if, if W1 and W2 are unit vector, like kind of the standard uh, vectors, then you get a, just a regular lattice, right? And uh, this would have uh, a very, like a well-defined, uh, it, it's going to be, if you start anywhere and you go in X direction or real direction, you're going to be periodic. And if you go in the y direction, you're going to be periodic as well, right? So this is why it means double periodic. Uh, the picture on the left, uh, there are certain, there are two independent directions, which your function looks periodic in, in that way. And now you can think of this m and n as a lattice coordinates, right? Uh, so m tells you how many steps in w1 direction, n tells you how many steps in w2 direction you're taking. Okay, and this identity here tells you that if you go that far, if you go uh, to like if you translate by a multiple of w1, w2, you're going to have the same value. So basically, you can say the value of the function here would be the same as here, would be the same as here, right? So mm -hmm. for the, the blue points, will all have the same value because they're different by just a lattice uh, multiple, right? Mm -hmm. This makes sense. Um, so what is, uh, so you can think of many functions. Uh, you can think of functions that have this property, uh, but the Weierstrass P function is a special one. Uh, you can actually read a lot. It, it's a very useful function. I don't want to, uh, let me just write one expression for this function. Uh, from the way it's defined, you will see uh, uh, why it's uh, doubly periodic. So uh, it has a double pole like a pole of degree two everywhere on the lattice vertex. Um, so let's say uh, lambda is my lattice point. So lambda is lattice generated by W1 and W2. And uh, except at zero, because at zero we already have one over Z squared. Uh, but at every other point, I, I'm gonna have one over z minus lambda squared uh, minus one over lambda squared. Okay, there is motivation behind this definition, but it, uh, you don't want to um, diverge. Uh, but from the way it's defined, they are parameters here lambda, but lambda runs over all lattice points. And think of when lambda is zero, we don't have zero, but if we had zero, this would be one over z squared, but this would be undefined one over lambda would be undefined. So that's why we take care of that one over z squared term separately. But other than that, everything here is symmetric with respect to all lattice points, okay? And if you look at any lambda, 
uh, you have a pole. This, this is not going to have a pole at lambda if lambda is not zero. This is going to give you a pole of degree two at any lambda. If you look at any other point, you, you have a definite value. You only have poles uh, at this lambda point. So this is a meromorphic function. with poles of degree two at, at the lattice points. Um, uh, to kind of finish today, uh, what, what happens in relation with the Weierstrass equation, remember we're, we're looking at uh, y squared equals four x cubed minus, I think it was g2, yes, g2 x. Uh, minus g3. Now, the Weierstrass equation actually satisfy, the Weierstrass function satisfy this, uh, p of u uh, prime squared is equal to 4 p of u and uh, minus g2 p of u minus g3, which is that equation, right? Mm -hmm. So it tells you if, if you have an elliptic curve, if you have an elliptic curve, you can turn that elliptic curve into this form. When your elliptic curve is in this form, you have constant g2 and g3. w1 and w2 are defined using g2 and g3. Uh, I don't want to explain it here. Like I think if you look at Wikipedia page, it has a uh, formula explanation how you can, from g2, g3, you can get w1, w2. So basically you start with elliptic curve. It has it this form, g2, g3, and then you find w1, w2. From w1, w2, you obtain this uh, p function, Weierstrass p function. And the Weierstrass p function, it is giving you a solution. It is giving you a solution to the differential equation. Remember, uh, we were looking at, and y was uh, the, was like u one dot, right? Mm -hmm. I remember that was u one dot. So you, you do have a solution and that's the explicit solution that you have in this case. Okay, so we obtained this explicit solution and uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna stop here. And uh, one last note is that in some sense, uh, this is um, linearization of a nonlinear system. So remember we started with U1, U2, U3, there was a nonlinear equation, but we end up with the linear equation. Okay, um, there's, uh, there's no nonlinear kind of uh, term here. And uh, yeah, I think that's it uh, for today. This is related to the uh, theta function, uh, theta function and uh, Riemann surface? Um, I'm sure it should be related uh, in a sense. I, I don't remember exactly, but I remember some week. Uh, maybe you can read. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe you're interested in this book. Uh, this book is uh, wait. Yeah, this book is the Harukimi. When I was in Arizona, but I didn't read it. Then I come to Kyoto. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So this. Uh, why did you? Uh, yeah. It's still upload, so um, please wait. Okay. Um. Uh, okay. Did you send me the book? Let me stop sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's uh, I, uh, it's it's about it's I guess wait just yeah yeah, yeah I send it. Can you see? It? Okay. Can you open it? Okay, I see. I haven't seen this. Uh, do you know the Wheaton's conjecture? Uh, what conjecture? No, I don't think I know that. The Wheaton's um, 
description. So basically, he uh, I think he gets uh, the somehow the uh, the tau function of the PDV has uh, I don't know the exact constructor, but uh, it related to some what to say. Maybe I can find the Wikipedia. I uh, did you explain the book? Uh, do you want to go somewhere in this book? Uh, yes, like the Witten's conductor. Uh, you can you can open. Oh, Witten. Okay, yeah, I see. Uh, um, so I think this book is. I think that I've heard of that one. I I that's definitely related to uh, some of the stuff I was doing. Yeah, what I was doing. So yeah, I now I I remember. Okay. Yeah, I think this this small note is uh, partially related uh, introduction to this context related. Uh, yes. Hmm. Okay, I see. Yeah, I, I yeah, there's a I think this is related to KDB hierarchy in a sense, um, and uh, there was expansion of tau function. Um, but I'm not an uh, expert on this. Yeah, I'm thinking to also talk about integral system or the kind of equation, something like this. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sounds oh, good. Yeah, well, um, so so maybe I see you next week then. Okay.